Hey there, everyone. Dave Keller here with Market Misbehavior. So the S&P 500 made new all-time highs this week, so that's bullish, right? Well, yes, and maybe not. Let's look at five market breadth indicators every investor should be following in January 2024. So a famous market strategist named Paul Montgomery published a uh, newsletter called Universal Economics for Decades, and he was famous for a quote saying, the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. So when the S&P 500 is making new all-time highs, that tends to be a good thing, and new highs tend to lead to further new highs. But I'm a little skeptical about the timing of those uh, additional movements to new uh, to new all-time highs. What you have to remember is a lot of times when the market uh, makes a new high, that doesn't guarantee that it will just continue unabated for weeks and months, if not years. Usually healthy drawdowns happen way more often than you probably want, particularly if you're bullish and you own long positions. We are in the seasonally weakest part of the year here in the first quarter of an election year, first quarter of 2024. So the odds are against us that the market would actually just go higher without some sort of meaningful drawdown. Today we're going to look at five different market breadth indicators that really talk about the individual stocks that make up those indexes. While the S&P, while the NASDAQ may be making new highs, what about all the companies, the hundreds of companies that make up those indexes? Are they also following the market higher? We have some breadth divergences right about now, some breadth conditions that were very overheated at the end of last year, becoming a lot less overheated right about now. We're going to get to the charts here in a minute. Before we do so, do me a favor, like this video, subscribe to my channel while you're here. I can't tell you how much I would appreciate that. And also drop a comment below. What do you see next? For the S&P 500, you see the next 10% move higher or lower and why. Don't forget to drop a comment below and let me know. Now, before we get to those five breadth indicators, here's one more thing I wanted to tell you about. The new year is a really good time to focus on routines. What do you do every day, every week, every month to improve your situational awareness as an investor, to identify potential opportunities and also manage risk? Seeking Alpha provides a quantitative model what they call their quant rating, and I think it's really well done. A lot of the institutional investors that I've worked with always had an alpha model, which is basically a quantitative model. It's a way of looking at the statistical measures that define healthy companies, strong companies, companies most likely to outperform form going forward, then you take all of those factors, you combine them into a model, and then you regularly run it to find companies demonstrating those same characteristics. By scanning for stocks showing strength using the, uh, the quant model on uh, Seeking Alpha, I think you have a good opportunity to identify potential opportunities that could help your portfolio going forward. If you go to marketmisbehavior.com slash Seeking Alpha, you can get a great deal on their premium membership, which gives you access to their, uh, their quantitative model, also all of their scanning tools tools, and also a lot of premium commentary as well. So go to marketmisbehavior.com slash seeking alpha. Start off the new year with a gift to yourself, the gift of better market awareness and a better sense of the opportunities of leading companies. And now let's get back to the charts. Okay, so here we can see the S&P 500, you know, third week in uh, January, obviously pushing to a new all-time high, just below 48.40. And what an incredible run, to be honest with you. Round tripping from that peak in July to the low in October. Once again, breaking to new highs in December. Pulling back here in the last, uh, you know, four to five weeks have really been range-bound, a tactical range between 47 and 4,800. Today, of course, we're recording this on uh, Friday the 19th, a close uh, above 4,800, really just pushing to uh, to new all-time highs. So what's next? Well, the most important thing we can follow is price. And one of my mentors, Ralph Akampore, used to say, the most important thing you can follow is a daily chart of the S&P 500. That'll tell you most of what you need to know. And I can't disagree with it, right? The fact that the major averages are going up is bullish, by definition, right? As a trend follower, I have to acknowledge that. But what you have to remember is even though the long-term trend could be constructive, and even though new highs can be uh, very, very positive signs, um, there are often significant drawdowns to a deal with. For example, if you look at June of 2023, if you look at July of 2023, very similar. We weren't making new all-time highs, but we were certainly making new 52-week highs and, and pushing above previous uh, peaks and certainly felt like the market conditions were very strong. We're in kind of a similar environment right now. We're making new highs. We're making higher lows. But what we have to remember is after any sort of big move, you usually have a reset. And the first quarter of an election year, the seasonal uh, seasonal pattern is usually a lot weaker than we've seen so far. So it's much more likely that January, February, March 
are a little choppy or a little less uh, certain uh, than a just, you know, bulls, uh, b- b- lights out bull sort of uh, phase to the upside. Most important thing, let's follow price. But let's talk about five market breadth indicators to follow to confirm or not confirm what we're seeing with price. One of the things that makes me skeptical of further upside at this particular moment is the fact that uh, the advanced decline lines for the major averages are not confirming these new highs yet. Here we're looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for the NYSE, for the large cap S&P 500, the mid cap S&P 400, and the small cap S&P 600. Now you'll note that while the S&P is breaking to a new high here in the top series, look at these other four charts. You can see all four of them in the last month are actually trending downwards. Some of them quite a bit like small caps and like the NYSE's broader universe of, uh, of, uh, of stocks. The large cap S&P is still, uh, the advanced decline line is still sloping downwards as well. So even the index that we're tracking, those 500 large companies, mega cap names, are not actually going higher, right? The advanced decline line is trending lower. So what does it mean when the market is going higher and these advanced decline lines are trending lower? It speaks to weaker breadth conditions. If you open the hood of the market, basically, and look underneath there, look at those 500 or 600 companies that make up a particular index, less of them are participating in this upward move. Now, the way we can determine that is because this is looking at the daily advancers, decliners reading, right? So every day you have the number of stocks closing up, the number of stocks closing down. You have a net difference called the advanced decline uh, uh, level, and that is a net difference of the total number of stocks closing up minus the close total number of stocks closing down. You take a running total of those daily measures over time and you have a cumulative advanced decline line. And on stock charts, we're tracking these for four different buckets of uh, US listed names, uh, the large cap, mid cap, small cap, and then at the top, which is the most important one that I like to follow is the New York Stock Exchange. It's a pretty broad uh, list of names, large, mid, small, all uh, pushed together. Now, what you have to remember is all of the breadth indicators we're gonna talk about are equal weighted. And that's one of the big differences. The S&P 500, The NASDAQ 100 are cap-weighted indexes, meaning those mega cap names like NVIDIA, like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, they have a huge weight in the index, right? A, in in uh, inordinately large a weight, I would argue, on the on those uh, indexes. So those top ten names probably have the same weight of the bottom three hundred to four hundred stocks in the S and P five hundred. That's how big of a weight. That's how much bigger they are on a market cap basis than all those other uh, stocks. So when the index is going higher and the breadth indicators are going down, that tells you the mega cap names are probably leading this market higher. And you can see that from charts of Nvidia and. AMD and other semiconductor names just blowing out uh, to new all-time highs well before today. Uh, Whereas other stocks uh, like energy stocks and uh, some defensive stocks for sure, like staples and industrials and materials and even consumer names are not making new highs just yet. Now they may resolve higher and that's what would be an important thing to watch on this chart is do you see the new highs in the S&P that we saw this week confirmed by the advanced decline lines going higher? But major market tops have often had this experience where the largest names are still working and a lot of the mid cap and small cap names are already breaking down. And that's why it gives me sort of a a bit of caution here in uh, mid-January. The second chart is what's called the McClellan Oscillator. Um, uh, And basically, this is an indicator uh, uh, created by uh, Sherman McClellan years ago, which basically uh, looks at advanced decline data in a little different way. It takes a couple exponential moving averages to smooth out that advanced decline data and uh, turn it into an oscillator, which is called why it's called the McClellan Oscillator. Very simply, when the McClellan Oscillator is above zero, that means that the um, advanced decline data is more bullish. When it goes below zero, it's more bearish. I'm oversimplifying and skipping a lot of the math here just to focus on how we can use these and how we can interpret the signals. So I've shaded on this chart in green when the McClellan Oscillator is above zero. And I've ignored one just like a one day uh, sort of whipsaw where it goes below and then reverts back. And then I've shaded in red anytime the McClellan Oscillator stays below zero for more than a day. And as you can look uh, on this uh, top section, you can see it's spent a good amount of time above and below zero over the last uh, 12 months or so. The bottom panel is showing the daily candle chart of the S&P 500. Just note the performance of the S&P during the green shaded areas. Note the performance of the S&P during the red shaded areas. And you can see, of course, that the pullback phases are all red. 
the rally phases, for the most part, are all green. Now, sometimes it's less of a price correction in red, like we saw in uh, the first quarter of 23, and more of a time correction, like you saw in uh, May of 2023. We didn't really lose a lot of ground. We just sort of had a sideways, choppy period. And maybe that's what we're experiencing here in early 2024, kind of similar to that April, May period, but waiting and being patient for the indicator to get back above zero has often helped me to avoid jumping into things way too early and being patient about uh, recognizing when the breadth conditions suggest that the likelihood of further upside is there. So for now, the McClellan oscillator went below zero. It really happened the first trading day in January. It had been bullish all through November and December of last year, which is a great signal uh, indicating that uh, strength off of the October low. But it broke down at the beginning of January and has remained below January, even with today's uh, you know uh, strong push higher with the S&P to new all-time highs. The indicator is still below zero. So that's one thing I would be waiting for to sort of give myself an all clear the conditions are getting better. Another breadth chart to watch is this one, which is looking at new 52-week highs and lows. Now, I have the S&P 500 uh, for the last year on a daily uh, um, uh, basis. And then this first panel is the net new highs minus new lows. So if the bars are black, that means on that particular day, there were more new 52-week highs than new 52-week lows. Bars in red indicate the opposite, more new lows than new highs. You can see when the market's going down, you tend to have more new lows than new highs. When the trend is positive, as it was in November and December of last year, you see more new highs than new lows. Now, this has been almost net uh, zero, right, for the last, uh, uh, really since the the beginning of the year. Uh, Just today, you saw a big push higher because there are a lot of new 52-week highs as the S&P started to break out. But one of the concerns I've had about this market in January is the fact that we just haven't had a ton of new 52-week highs, uh, and they really haven't outnumbered uh, the number of stocks making new 52-week lows. As a matter of fact, in the last week, even today, you see that there are plenty of uh, companies in the New York Stock Exchange, which is this middle panel, and the S&P 500, there's just a couple uh, making a new 52-week low. So remember, that's not just something going down. That's something making a new low for the last 12 months. So that means something that's in a pretty significant downtrend to get all the way down to that point. So right now, I would be looking at these uh, uh, sections at the bottom, right? The more green that you see, the less red, the more bullish that is. So I would say as the S&P is making a new high, one of the things that would validate the likelihood of further upside from current levels would be more green at the bottom of this chart, which would tell you over time, every day, every week, you're seeing additional stocks, not just a small number of names making new new 52-week highs, but a lot more individual names. That's something I think that we've been missing for quite some time, something I would certainly be, uh, be looking for. The fourth breadth indicator to look for would be this one. This is the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. I also have in blue here, this uh, first panel down is the uh, percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average. Now, it's important to note that this indicator is well above 50%. That's one of the ways that I use this one, the percent above their 200-day. Most stocks in the S&P are above their 200-day moving average. I think that's encouraging. Uh, That's sort of my long-term gauge. And as long as this remains above 50%, on pullbacks, I think that conditions are getting okay. This is one of the signals that I saw in mid-September of last year, which told me to expect much further downside for stocks because most names had already broken below their 200-day, even though the S&P had not, a lot of individual names obviously already had. Now, this panel at the bottom is looking at the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. At the end of last year, we got up to 90%, so nine out of 10 S&P stocks were above their 50-day moving average, which is a good short-term gauge of, uh, of, uh, of trend uh, stability, I would say. Look to the left at the previous times that the uh, indicator has got up to this pink shaded area, which is right, right above 85%. And you can see that it lines up pretty well with tactical peaks. Not long-term peaks, right? So you saw a signal in December, late November, early December of, uh, of 22. We had a pullback for a couple weeks before a move to new swing high. So, and again, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a similar type of pullback, but it tells me to expect more of a pullback than we've seen so far, given the fact that this breadth indicator has gotten to the place it's been at previous tactical market peaks. The final breadth indicator I'll share with you is the bullish percent index. And I've done other videos on this channel uh, digging into the bullish percent index into a little more detail. This is a breadth indicator based on point and figure charts. Point and figure charts, if you've not seen them, they have little X's and O's. And X is a series of uptrends. Then when the market goes down, you move to the next column of O's and it goes down. And it was born uh, years and years ago and really became popular on the uh, trading floors of Chicago. And early in my career, I got to go to the CME, the uh, SIBO, and... Uh, see how traders would actually update by hand their point and figure charts uh, just to get a sense of the trend on different time frames uh, for the uh, commodities and the futures that they were trading. 
Now, what we can do is take those uh, point figure charts and turn them into breadth indicators. So this indicator is called the S&P 500 bullish percent index. It's looking at the 500 stocks in the S&P and basically looking at all 500 point and figure charts. This tells you what percent of those 500 uh, point and figure charts are in a bullish phase. And a point and figure chart, the most recent signal is either bullish or bearish by definition, right? That's how the point and figure charts work. It's either bullish or bearish at any particular time. So this is saying that around 70% of the S&P 500 uh, point and figure charts are bullish right now. Now that seems pretty good and, and you're not wrong, right? It's actually pretty encouraging when it gets above 70%. I've highlighted in red when it's done that. You can see breaking above that level doesn't mean that the trend is over. Often you'll see further upside once that indicator uh, happens. But look at what happens when the indicator breaks below 70%. And you can see that usually happens after the major top or right around that major top, right? And what happens is as a bullish phase gets a little more extended, as more and more stocks are participating, we get over 70% while most stocks have now created a point and figure buy signal, which means they've broken out essentially. When things start to roll over, even though the major benchmarks continue to make higher highs as we're seeing this week, a lot of individual names already start to break down. So this indicator was above 80% at the end of last year. It's now down to around 70%, which means about 10% of the S&P have given a, a sell signal from their point and figure chart just in the last couple of weeks. So looking at this indicator to see if we do indeed move below 70%, in the next week or so uh, would, for me, uh, look very similar to previous tactical market peaks. And again, this is not a bearish video. I think overall the conditions for stocks are, are quite good, and I wouldn't be surprised if we go above 5,000 through the course of 2024. But it just tells me the timing right now is more tactically bearish because we're making new highs on weaker breadth conditions. Now, what would tell me I'm wrong? main thing would be the market continues to go higher and i think with any sort of strategy or any sort of analysis particularly using technical analysis in the markets you have to be prepared to be wrong you have to look for signs that your uh, thesis is just incorrect so for me uh, movements to new highs higher lows on pullback are all bullish um, uh, if these breadth indicators become less negative but start to revert higher and push back to extreme levels could all indicate a strengthening market as more and more stocks are moving higher. But based on what I'm seeing right now, it looks a lot more similar to uh, short-term market peaks than it does to the beginning of a big breakout uh, to further highs after what we've seen so far. What do you think? Next 10% move for the S&P 500. Do you think that's higher or lower and why? Don't forget to drop a comment below and let me know. For Market Misbehavior, I'm Dave Keller. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you again soon.